who is gay and asked if he could kiss him. And the main character goes, but the kiss wasn't bad. There's no teen angst in this. He's just going thinking about it. And in the background, apocalyptic bugs all over the place. And I know you're sitting there going, that is the most ludicrous sounding book I've ever heard. It's not. It's amazing. It's fun. It's thoughtful. It's well written. It's got a good teen voice. And I highly recommend it. Um, it's just one of those books you just have to read before you get out of high school. Oh, Ellen. Ellen, come on up. I like the horns. Um, I really, I loved Grasshopper Jungle. Um, as other people have said, the main character, he was just, I found him very relatable. I mean, if you look past the giant bugs, it was definitely a story where I could sort of see myself. I found that his struggles, you know, I could definitely recognize things that I had gone through. So I just, I feel that this was very, very well written and it's an excellent portrayal. And it was very refreshing that the author actually used the word bisexual rather than just hinting at it and never saying it. And so I think that this is a really good book and a step in the right direction in more ways than one. I'd you like have something to, to say about that Grasshopper Jungle? Yes, I do. Okay. Grasshopper Jungle has won the American Library Association Prince Committee Honor Book Award, as well as the Eva Perry Mom Prince Honor Book Award. Lots of awards for this book. Wow. I should probably read it. All right. Next award will be going to the best male character, and also Caroline is presenting this award, so. The best male character in a starring role had three nominations. First being Austin from the aforementioned Grasshopper Jungle by Andrew Smith. Secondly, Travis from Noggin by John Corey Whaley. And finally, The True Tale of the Monster Billy Dean as told by himself by David Ullman. And the winner is... Jungle! Stickers being Austin from Grasshopper Jungle by Woo! You think you saw that coming, Reed? Uh, <laughs> no, I actually didn't see it coming. <laughs> All right, our next award will be Best Female in a Starring Role. And we've got Richie and... Kaya. Kaya. <laughs> Kaya, I can't read that on the board. Oh, let's see. You butchered my partner's name. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we're presenting the Best Female Character in a Starring Role. And we have... Sorry. We have Yulia from Secret by Lindsay Smith. And Candace from We Were Liars by E. Lockhart. And then we have Ava, The Strange and Beautiful Sorrows of Ava Lavender by Leslie Walt. So let's see who the winner is. Drum roll, please. Ava from The Strange and Beautiful Sorrows of Ava Lavender. <laughs> Paper. Now we get to talk about Ava Lavender, and who better to talk about it than oh. uh, someone who had the right to get kicked out of heaven. Oh, thank you. Excuse me, I think that was rude. Hey, all the awards I've won so far. Uh, <laughs> true. The Strange and Beautiful Sorrows by Leslie Walton. It's a book about a girl born with wings. Uh, into a family cursed to be foolish with love. 16-year-old Ava delves into her family's past, hoping to understand her unusual nature and learn to fit in with her peers, but she is ill-prepared for what she discovers. So we, she was born with wings? She was born with wings. And everybody else in her family was born special. But mm -hmm. not like special, talented in art, but one of her aunts turned into a canary and just mm -hmm. a bunch of amazing things happened to this family, but they don't they're amazingly tragic or amazingly magical, but they don't see them as either. They see them as just part of life. So. Interesting. Yeah, turning into birds and having wings. Well, Bent. Then, then, yes. 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 Well, mm -hmm. oh, we got more people. Interesting. So I also read this book. I really enjoyed it. I liked the style of the prose, the characters. I really liked the way the author chose to go into the history of the family. Because although the title character is Ava Lavender, you start out with 
I think even her great grandmother, not just her grandmother. And so you get a feel by the time you actually get to the main character of the book, you already know her family history of turning into a canary and these bizarre instances that they just treat as normal. And so when you get to this girl with wings, you're just like, yeah, okay, I can believe that. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. And I just, I really appreciate the way that she wrote this. And I also loved this book and I enjoyed um, the development between the generations and how you can see their lives fit together. Um, and also, uh, the style of writing is amazing and it draws you in with all the imagery. Um, and then the end, the end is incredible. And I'm not going to say it because I don't like spoiling books, but you must read it for the end. Don't tell me, Dan. Now I have to read it. Good. Oh, where are you two going? <laughs> Get back up here! Before we go on to the next award, I'd just like to ha say a little few words as well about Ava Lavender. Um, first off, congratulations, Ms. Walton, for winning the William Morris Debut YA Novel Finalist Award. Mm. As well as one of the reasons why this book sort of <clears throat> appealed to me was because of um, La the Lavender family's story and how I could relate a lot, especially to Ameline. Do you have wings? No. <laughs> who migrated to the U.S. At, a, at such a time period when, you know, yeah. But long story short, it was just absolutely bizarre and poignant and all of these things and it was definitely such worth to read in, to the very end, so yeah. All right, a hand for Ava Lavender. Come on back up. Our next award is for the best male character in a supporting role, and you two are back. Lovely. So, the best male character in a supporting role, our nominees are Robbie from Grasshopper Jungle by Andrew Smith, and Hutton Sharp by, from In Noggin by John Corey Whaley. And the winner of Best Male Character in a Supporting Role is... Drum Roll! Bobby from Grasshopper Jungle. Woo! Another one for the thing. What? How many awards is that now? Uh, three? Three. Three? Yeah, it's three. All right, thank you, ladies. All right, yeah, well, that's a lot for a green book. <laughs> All right, our next award is the best female character in a supporting role, and we have David, David and Nick. Caitlin. Caitlin. <laughs> I'll take that. Sorry. Okay. All the horns seem to be orange and red this evening. That's nice. It's really a special. Of course it is. <laughs> the best female character in a supporting role. We have Cardigan from The Strange and Beautiful Sorrows of Ava Lavender by Leslie Walton. And we have Chivon, The Story of Owen, Dragon Slayer of Sheridan by E.K. Johnson. And drum roll, please. And it's a tie. Oh! Oh my gosh! Ooh. That's an anomaly, isn't it? That's not supposed to happen. Well, it's, <gasps> it's an anomaly! Cardigan from The Strange and Beautiful Stars of Ava Lavender by Leslie Walton. And Shivon, The Story of Ellen, Dragon Slayer of Jordan by E.K. Johnson. Woo! 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 <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have another award for the, my personal favorite, quirkiest character. Oh, who is doing this? Our lovely angel. Oh, you excuse me. I should have planned better. I'm really sorry. <coughs> <laughs> I'm going to put you in a birdcage the next time you come up here. <laughs> uh, the quirkiest, nominated for the quirkiest characters are Finn from 100 Sideways Miles by Andrew Smith, Ava from The Strange and Beautiful Sorrows of Ava Lavender by Leslie Walton, Zoe from The Museum of Intangible Things by Wendy Wonder, Billy Dean, the true tale of the monster Billy Dean as told by himself, his self, by David Almond. Noah, I'll Give You the Sun by Jandy Nelson. Henry, The Strange and Beautiful Sorrows of Ever Lavender by Leslie Walton. And oh, Skink man. by Carl Hyacin. So, 
and it's a tie again. They what? Oh, what? No, no that's not this can't be happening. <laughs> Between twi Finn from 100 Sideways Miles by Andrew Smith and Billy, the true tale of the monster Billy Dean, told by himself by David Allman. I believe it's time we talk about the true tale of the monster Billy Dean, told by himself by David Allman. And presented by me, obviously. Because you're beautiful. Thank you. Ooh, it's got black pages. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the true tale of the monster Billy Dean, told by himself, by David Almond, published by Candlewick Press. Trapped in his bedroom by a father who fills his mind with mysterious tales and warnings, Billy Dean goes outside for the first time when his father disappears, and he discovers his abilities to heal the living and contact the dead. So, wow. Now I see why he was locked away. One of the reason, one of the things that also appealed to me about Billy Dean was the writing style, because. At the beginning, if you look, mm. it appears that he doesn't write well. He writes sort of like a four-year-old boy. But as you as he progresses through the story, his writing gets better. But it gets more than just that. He's, for to me, he's the, the epitome of innocence in this world where har, rea, the reality, harsh realities of life revolve around him. And he sort of in, interacts with it in a in a one in an unconventional way. And that unconventional Libby ultimately proves to show his humanity in the inside all along. And so that's what I think is good. All right. Can I say something about it? Can oh, sure. This book may um, turn you away at first, if only because most of the words are misspelled. But um, his writing style truly is endearing. And if you learn at first just his journey through literacy, and the way he begins to learn to write and writes with, with the blood of, with blood on animal skins and just struggles to learn how to write and write these words down. And then he begins to tell his own story and goes out into the world. And Lyle was right. He really is innocence in a harsh and cold world and the effect he has on the people around him. This is a truly marvelous book. It's breathtaking and and it's poignant. I would definitely recommend it to anyone. Even if you read the first page and say, why, why are all the words spelled wrong? You'll love it. You'll love it anyway. I promise. Mm -hmm. It's a very good book. Thank you. Thanks, Kev. Oh, well, we have something to say. That's all right. Billy Dean is a character who has been locked away for most of his life and the town doesn't really know he exists. There was a war in this town and there is so much sadness because so many of the children were killed that when Billy Dean finally emerges from this ha room that he's been locked in, everybody's very excited to see him. Billy Dean goes through his life trying so hard to please a father that is not really happy with him. And it's nothing that Billy Dean has done, but Billy Dean feels like he, he, he has this need to please his father. So even though it's written, and parents, you'll have a good time reading this, adults, because it'll be like when your kids were little and writing stories, it was kind of like that. For the teens, if you have trouble reading it, read it out loud, just as you would pronounce it, and it will make more sense. But as he grows and realizes that he can't please his father, you can see the maturity coming up in him. And the writing starts to become more uh, knowledgeable. He's using words. He's spelling things correctly. And so you can watch his writing actually shows his change in person. So thank you. Great book. Thanks, Valerie. Now, we actually had a question posted on our, is that the Twitter? Twitter. It's a Twitter feed. Someone posted a question on our Twitter feed asking for an explanation about the fashion show in the beginning of our show. So I am going to call up the beautiful, lovely Ellen. And the handsome David. <laughs> if you can't quite see him, it's because his costume's all black oh, or yellow. All right, well, come on in. <laughs> Don't be shy. Wait, what 
What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> they wanted an explanation to why we had the fashion show in the beginning of the show. Oh, we had the fashion show because a lot of our people here are young teens who um, really like expressing themselves in ways that they don't normally. And a lot of people want, just want a reason to dress up fun and also dress up as like uh, our beautiful Ava Lavender, uh, characters from the book. And um, it also gives us a really good chance to sort of get people's opinions on books, hear which books people are feeling are going to win before we actually figure out who's right and who's <coughs> favoring the wrong book this year, so to speak. But I got a new dress. <laughs> Thank you for helping with the explanation. All right. What's our next? Our it's next best antagonist. Oh, I love these presented guys. Presented by Caroline once more. All right. Is that right? <laughs> Hello. We're seeing a lot of you tonight, Caroline. Fantastic. The story is complete without a conflict, and thus our nominees for best antagonist are Major Rostov from Secret by Lindsay Smith. Father, from the true tale of the monster Billy Dean as told by himself by David Ullman. Nathaniel Sorrows, from the strange and beautiful Sorrows of Ava Lavender by Leslie Walton. And Barkley, from Before My Eyes by Caroline Bach. Hmm. And our winner for tonight. Drum roll! <laughs> Nathaniel Sorrows, from the strange and beautiful Sorrows of Ava Lavender by Leslie Walton. <laughs> Three for Ava Lavender. Oh, but technically that's three for uh, Grasshopper Jungle it's because the, mm -hmm. this is the Mount Prince Award, remember? Oh, well, if you want <laughs> I'm a picky person. Yes, and that's what you yeah. And the most realistic romance is up next, ladies and gentlemen. Presented and by Sherlock Holmes and lovely Ava. Time to go get the birdcage. Okay, again with the birdcage. Oh, it's comfy. So, can they all love romance? Yes. So, the most realistic yeah. one is the contenders for it are Finn and Julia in the Hundred Side and Three Ways Miles by Andrew Smith, Julia and Valentin, Secret by Lindsay Smith, hmm. Harry and Cheyenne, and the Scar Boys by Lynn Ballows. And the winner is. The Scar Boys by Lynn Ballard. Woo! Thank you, ladies. Oh. So, let's talk about Scar Boys, ladies and gentlemen, since it has yet to really be talked about. Mm -hmm. Would you like to read the summary this time, reading? I think we well, should. Yeah, she read it. That's a good idea. So, Scar Boys is by Lynn Ballard, um, published by Egmont USA. It's written as a college admission essay. 18-year-old um, Harry Jones recounts a childhood defined by hideous scars he hid behind and how forming a band brought self-confidence, friendship, and his first kiss. I should form a so, band. Do you agree? Nah, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> so I personally love this book. I felt like Harry's character was very real and I connected personally with him because he dealt with trauma and suffered from anxiety and panic attacks from it. And I feel like the message at the end of this book, a lot of people are going to benefit from it and it's going to really touch them personally. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I should probably read it. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to present my little two cents to put for this book. Um, Harry and Cheyenne's dynamic was definitely interesting. And I really liked how in the end they became just sort of platonic friends in the end. And not all romances have to, romances have to sort of have a happy ending, but at least it'd be one where both sides, both parties, um, have a mutual agreement about what's the deal and all and such. So yeah, there's that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> if you could help me find my car keys after this, that'd be fantastic. Um, before we move on, once more, 
The Scar Boys by Len Blahus won the American Library Association Prince Honor Award, the William Morris debut YA novel finalist award, and the Eva Perry Mock Prince Honor Award as well. So kudos to you, Mr. Dawkins. Woo! That's all awards. All right, who's up next? Most Memorable Kiss, presented Aww. by David, my best I knew friend. Kiss. Okay. <laughs> No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Most memorable kiss to June and Oscar. I'll give you the sun by Jandy Nelson, and No and Heather. I'll give you the sun by Jandy Nelson. Interesting. Drum what book is gonna win? Let's find out. <laughs> and most memorable kiss goes to. Oh no, it's a tie. What? what? Oh, oh my gosh! A third? To Jude and Oscar from I'll Give You the Sun by Jandy Nelson, and to Noah and Heather by I'll Give You the Sun. I mean, uh, t yeah. <laughs> I'll Give You the Sun by Jandy Nelson. There we go. Lots in it. Oh, yes. What? <laughs> Starting with I'll Give You the Sun by Jandy Nelson. All right. All right, so I'll Give You the Sun by Jandy Nelson. A story of first love, family, and loss and betrayal told from different points in time and in separate voices by artist Jude and her twin brother Noah. Hmm. <clears throat> I, one of the biggest, one of the things that I really liked about I'll Give You the Sun is, okay, you can hold I'm going to read it. You keep talking. <laughs> um, is the is the sibling relationship between both between the siblings? Um, they I don't kiss, do they? No, they. No. <laughs> well, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> read. Um, I found that I thought it was interesting how both points of view in the story tells how, sort of how each other one feels about the other and vice versa, as well as their journey from sort of being estranged in the beginning and then halfway ending up becoming closer again as before, despite all of the um, tribulations that they had to go through. Um, that's probably one of the favorite parts about it, as well as the relationships in the book, which were really cute and made me happy. Um, Apparently they're kissed. And after much consideration, I will have to agree with Miss Valerie here that Noah and Heather's kiss was definitely more beautiful and just, <laughs> wow! And I hope my friend is not hearing this. Like that too. So yeah, there's that. John, John I'm looking at you, buddy. <laughs> anyway, yes. Since it was a tie, we have to talk about the other memorable kiss inside "And We Stay" by Jenny Hubbard and Caroline, if you would please. Really? <laughs> What's that no. memorable kiss? No, I think "And We Stay." Okay, well, so. Uh, I'll no, give you the sun. Right, was it an official American Library Association trip? We've gone about it. Yes. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. Please, share. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, I'll give you the sun by Jandy Nelson, also won the American Library Association Prince Award. So, the the oh. Win winner, the official one. Yes, there the we go. The official winner. Ooh, I got some kind of. All right, now where is And We Stay? Right here, And We Stay. Right. Where is she? Right here. Here. Oh, she's already at the book. Never mind. Ignore me. Will do. And We Stay by Jenny Hubbard is published by Delacorte Press. It's about a girl named Emily. She is sent to Amherst, Massachusetts boarding school after her ex-boyfriend shoots himself. She expresses herself through poetry as she relives their relationship, copes with her guilt, and begins to heal. Hmm. The poetry in this book, you can tell already, is heavily inspired by Emily Dickinson. Uh, the, girl named, the girl's name is Emily, and her boarding school is located not far from a house where Emily Dickinson used to live. And as she reads this poetry, she begins to create her own and begins to find herself coping with this, tra this tragedy that she's had to bend through, that she's had to go through. And she copes with it by writing this poetry. And sometimes you open a teen novel and the poetry, and the main character, or some character writes poetry. And the poetry's all right. And you think, okay, that's a, that's an okay poem. This poetry blew me away. I thought that it was something I would read in 
you know, English class, a literature book or something. Jenny Hubbard has done a fantastic job, and I cannot thank her enough, for writing this poetry. This beautiful, these beautiful verses which, um, which intersperse the prose and really add to it. And as this girl discovers herself through poetry and begins to define herself as a poet, it's really beautiful and it's very good. You should read it. Are you about to cry? No, I'm not about to cry. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's fine if you do. <laughs> um, also, Ms. Hubbard won the American Library Association Prince Honor Award, so congrats to you. All right. All right. Our next award is for the best cover, and that is presented by Allie, Allie and Jenna. And Jenna. Woo. Come on up. The microphone awaits. So we are presenting the award for best cover, and our nominees are Grasshopper Jungle by Andrew Smith. A Hundred Sideways Miles by Andrew Smith. <laughs> the Unfinished Life of Al Addison Stone by Adele Griffith. And drum roll, please. <laughs> oh, no. ah. It's okay. It's okay. Keep drum rolling. Uh, you don't really hear nothing. Double faster. There we go. Okay. The winner is A Hundred Sideways Miles by Andrew Smith and... Oh my what? goodness. Finished Life of Addison Stone by Abdel Griffin. Oh, yeah. 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 That's, that, that's too many ties, man. And since we're here, let's talk about the Unfinished Life. These are the covers of your. Oh. There we go. That is 100 is Sideways Miles an and. Unfinished Life of Addison Stone. Yes. Would you like to I will hold on to this one. Thank you, and I'll read this one. Okay. All right. 100 sideways miles. What, you want to go first? No, go ahead. I'll, I'll let you oblige. You sure? Yes. Oh. All right. 100 sideways miles by Andrew Smith, published by Simon and Schuster, Finn Easton, 16, and epile 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 epileptic. Sorry, I can't. My tons in a knot struggles to feel like more than just a character in his father's cult classic novels with the help of his best friend, Kate Hernandez, and first love, Julia, until Julia moves away. Oh, I feel the pain, buddy. I feel the pain. Oh, that's kind of sad. I'm almost feeling sad for you. I might almost feel sad for you. No, I'm kidding. You know that, right? Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So, a hundred sideways miles. I think I'm holding it right. This is kind of crazy. It, the, the horse is upside yes, down. Yes, I know. First off, the cover itself lets you know that this is going to be one heck of a ride. Does a horse actually <laughs> fall from the sky? Actually, this horse, the reason why this horse is, back, is falling down like this is because um, Finn's mother actually was killed by a horse that fell from the sky during a train accident. What? I'm not sure. So the know. horse fell from a train. Actually, from... I think Ellie can yeah, explain, Ellie explain this. <laughs> so um, the story goes that when he was a lot younger, he and his mom were down by a creek, you know, like picking up okay. water like we do. Go. And there's a knackery down the road. So there's a truck carrying a dead horse, and there's a little accident on the bridge. Um, end result being that the horse ends up falling on a uh, What's his, sorry. Uh, Finn's mother. Finn and his mother, uh, which results in him breaking his spine in several locations, which ends up in him being epileptic. So, thank you. So for some reason, I thought it was a train accident. I don't know. My head is weird. But on another note, um, only 380 books. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 380. So many to keep up with. But Finn Easton reminded me of myself in a lifetime long ago. But on another note, I had really enjoyed how um, his struggle and his development throughout the story. I really liked the idiosyncrasies that he had along with his character, as well as um, how it was interesting that he was like a character in his dad's no novels. And I never really heard that in the novel book before, so that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I can't say anything else because this is just really good. <laughs> it's definitely good. So yeah. All right. And the unfinished life of Addison Stone by a. I 
Adele Griffin, sorry, published by Soho Teen. When a celebrated New York City teenager known for her su subversive. subversive street art, I can't read, <laughs> mysteriously dies, her life is examined in a series of interviews with her parents, friends, boyfriends, mentors, and critics. Thank you. Oh, I'm so alone. <laughs> but um, <coughs> the, when, I, when I first read this book, um, I actually thought Addison Stone was a real person because the way that Adele Griffin wrote it really made it really seem like a sort of biography to put. But then I looked her up online and found out she wasn't real after all, so I kind of felt disappointed. But um, what? It's not real? Yes, Give me this. Stone is not a real person. Could you believe that? But there's actually pictures. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll take that now. Thank you. But um, on another note, one of the reasons why. I love this book. Was its sort of message about how such a prodigy as Addison Stone, who had a few, bright future ahead of her in art, she was sort of the fame that she had gained. It sort of tainted her because she craved more and more and more of it until ultimately her demise. Um, one of the quotes that I really liked here, both her scenes, was in the beginning, where um, she asks. Um, care a man to ca to catch her in video hanging from a chandelier in an art room, and he asks her if what if she dies, and she says, "If I'm going to die, at least make it be a death worth watching for." And so that gave me absolute chills. And um, overall, I, this book was just phenomenal. I did not read the unfinished life of Addison Stone. <laughs> But listening to the teens talk about this book in our meetings with such passion, they actually talked me into this book and I voted for it, having not read it, just listening to the reaction of the teens talking about this book. I, thought I will be it. reading this book tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> Ooh, I'm so excited. All right. No, She's going to read the book. Wait, wait, wait. Because I'm so tiny and it's all in the back. You had to step up there, didn't Yes, you? I did. Um, congratulations. Oh, wait, no, actually, never mind. I lied. I thought there was something there. I can't see. Here, you, you take it. Okay, this. our next award is for the best title, and presenting the best title will be Gemma. Jenna. Jenna. <laughs> wow. And you. you. And oh, okay. Yay! Out of the way. Um, <laughs> the nominees for best title go to Grasshopper Jungle by Andrew Smith, Death Coming Up the Hill by Chris Crow. The Summer I Saved the World in 65 Days by Michelle Weber Hurwitz. The Museum of Intangible Things by Wendy Wonder. And The Strange and Beautiful Sorrows of Ava Lavender by Leslie Walton. Drum roll, please. <laughs> and the winner is The Strange and Beautiful Sorrows of Ava Lavender by Leslie Walton. Thank you, Jenna. That is four for four. That is four no, awards. Because my favorite person. Oh, the next. So, our presenter for best unreliable narrator is my beautiful angel, <laughs> whose well, wings are as white as silver and something well, along those lines. Well, like, like, as know. white as silver, isn't it? As white as snow. I think so. Give it a second. All right, switch over. <laughs> After you. The Best Unreliable Narrator. The nominees are Jamie, Complicit by Stephanie Kuhn, Travis, Noggin by John Corey Whaley, Candace, and We Were Liars by E. Lockhart, Beljar, Beljar, Meg Wallitzer, as in Give Me Your Wallet. No. <laughs> I, I really apologize for that. Billy Dean, the true tale of the monster Billy Dean as told by himself by David Almond. And that's all we have. And there's nothing. What? Oh. 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 No. Are you serious? Oh my goodness. I, I can that Chris? <laughs> what is this, Chris? What is this sorcery? What 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 witchcraft is this? <laughs> Sorry <Very> folks. <laughs> <laughs> David say out of it. It's crap. <laughs> and Travis, Travis, Travis. 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 Travis.
Sorry, the lady walks away. All right, who wants to come and talk about noggin? Brian, I found you. I saw noggin for this. You really did. You were the only one who talked about it. All right, now scooch over. That's, that's so sad. After you, Brian. I must preach the glory of noggin. Well, <laughs> preach. There's a camera. Yes. <laughs> My people. By <laughs> John Corey Whaley. After dying at age 16, Travis Coates' head was removed and frozen for five years. Ew. Yes, it's kind of disgusting, but yeah. <laughs> before being attached to another body, and now the old Travis and the new must find a way to coexist while figuring out changes in Isn't his relationship. Isn't technically the old Travis? He just got an upgrade? Um, no, he's not, like, his body is now, I'm trying to remember what the guy's name is. Well, obviously, the guy didn't need the body. <laughs> yeah, so oh. the body came from another guy who died from a brain tumor. I remember that much. Mm -hmm. There's also this whole little subplot while well, like how he still has the muscle memory from that guy. In. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. Not yeah, and about Noggin. <laughs> yes. So, Noggin, as I mentioned earlier, a book about life, death, and life again. <laughs> in that order. Yes, in that okay. order. You can't life and then life again, and then die. How do you, you know? <laughs> Theoretically, if you had two lives, you, you wouldn't die once. And I don't know. It doesn't seem mathematically correct, but Me. we're we're talking about math and death here. Okay. <laughs> I mean, All right. how is this book not amazing? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. All right. Is that, oh yes, you want to oh, say. Valerie something. wants to say oh. something. <clears throat> Oh, yes. Decapitations. Uh, and bodies. All right, decapitations. Read, 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 read. Can't forget the freezing. What? Brian and I championed this book. I know it almost sounds like it's going to turn you off. He had his head taken off and put on another body. That makes it science fiction, but that's kind of where the science fiction ends because it's about a young man who is trying to re enter into a world that has changed. When he was frozen, he expected that when he came back 75, 100 years from now, everybody he knew would be gone and that everybody, the world would be changed. But unfortunately, only five years went by. The world is the same except for him. The same people are there, but they've grown up. His parents are there, but things have changed at home. And not only does this young man have to deal with the changes to everything in his life, but he also has to come to terms with his body. Because when he looks down at his body, he doesn't recognize his hands or his chest or his feet or his other parts. <laughs> and it's just a really compelling book of him trying to re-enter into a world where, quite frankly, he almost doesn't belong anymore. And he feels like that also. And he desperately, desperately is trying to get the world back from five years ago. And it's just interesting, fascinating, but psychologically fascinating. Thank you. If I can just say one quick word. Yes. You'll notice throughout the entire book, Travis never says, I know this like the back of my hand. No! Snap it off. All right, I'm out, peace. <laughs> Next award is for the most issuey. Not quite sure what issuey. It's just most issuey. And here's Richie and Jenna. Jenna, yeah. Richie, here you go. Thank you. Okay, so we have the most issuey award, and we have Hidden Girl by Shima Hall and Lisa Wisucki, and Noggin by John Corey Whaley. And then Endangered by Elliot Schaefer. And Skink by Carl Hyacin. And Grasshopper Jungle by Andrew Smith. Can we get a drum roll? And the winner is Grasshopper Jungle by Andrew Smith. Woo! Jungle and the Strange and Beautiful Sorrows of Ava Lavender. They seem to be taking all the awards tonight, people. Next award. Best Beautiful Literary assistant. Girlfriend, oh. presented by Ellen and Jenna. <laughs> Jenna, you might as well just stay out here. You probably volunteer for everything. So, our nominees for Best Literary Girlfriend are Shannon from Grasshopper Jungle by Andrew Smith. And Vivian from The Strange and Beautiful Sorrows of Ava Lavender by Leslie Walton. 
All right, drum roll. Even though it's for the same two books. And our winner is Vivian from The Strange and Beautiful Sorrows of Ava Lavender from Leslie Walton. Two books are get, just gain all the awards, people. Ooh, this is my favorite one. What is it? <laughs> Best Literary Boyfriend, presented by me. I'm telling you, John, watch out! Thank you. <clears throat> Ross, from The Straight to Beautiful Sorrows of the Lavender, by Leslie Walton. Harry, from The Scar Boys, by Len Blahos. Cowboy, from The Things You Kiss Goodbye, by Leslie Connor. Finn, from The Impossible Life of Memory, by Laurie House Anderson. Gabe from The Strange and Beautiful Sorrows of David Lavender by Leslie Walton, and then finally Rowe, The Strange and Beautiful Sorrows of David Lavender by Leslie Walton. Drum roll! All right. I can't stop. Oh, no. Ah! <laughs> All right. <clears throat> At least you didn't rip the words. And the winner is Gabe from The Strange and Beautiful Sorrows of Ava Lavender by Leslie Walton. Another award to the angel. Now, before we move on, we yes. have an announcement to make because the story of Owen, Dragon Slayer of Trondheim by E.K. Johnston won the William Morris debut YA novel finalist award. So congratulations. A hand to the world. You talk about this book, man. You talk about it. Yes. Dragons, 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 dragons. <laughs> There's dragons? That's not what it says on the back. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I know, you have to read those. <laughs> the Story of Owen by E.K. Johnson, published by Carol Roja Books. An alternate world where industri industrialization has caused many species of carbon-eating dragons to thrive. Owen, a slayer being trained by his famous father and aunt, and Zivahan, his bard, the face, face the dragon infestation near their small town in Canada. Okay, so. Something um, happens in Canada. Yes, dragons are part of like, today's society. Let's go! <laughs> Sorry, but they'd probably destroy you. Can I just throw dynamite at them? Nah. nah. <laughs> um, and dragons are thriving in today's society because they live off of carbon which, as you know, our society is basically like producing by tons and tons and tons of carbon yeah. waste. You know, we're only human. Yeah. And uh, I forget what city it is. I think it's Detroit for some reason. Um, that area became so carbon infested that literally... Michigan. Oh, whole state of Michigan. I'm so sorry. Um, whole state of Michigan had become so infested with carbon that literally that area is inhabitable because there's just so many dragons that if anyone even tried to get in there, they just get eaten up. Um, the main character, Owen, uh, is um, a young dragon slayer uh, raised by his aunts. Yes, plural, aunts. He um, is raised by his lesbian aunts uh, who have trained him and they have a forge and honestly are just complete awesome people. I was gonna say it was a different word, but um, <laughs> and uh, it is really such an amazing book. I would suggest it to anyone who likes reading fantasy. All right, huh? Ooh, and Allie, you want to talk about the book too? Can you go back to your chair. So one of the other things that I loved about this was dragon slaying became a profitable career to go into, and it also became a celebrity to career to go into. Celebritized, you know, yeah. words. <laughs> And so, the big thing that sparked this was his aunt's move. His aunt's move back to a small town, and it showed the value of a small town. And she was trying to get the world to go back to valuing small towns. And coming from and growing up in a series of small towns from my grandparents and such, I really took to heart that. And I think it also showed values in other things that we kind of take for granted such as the family aspect. A lot of YA <coughs> books don't have a family in them. You have your narrator, and you have your antagonist, and you have all of these people, but where are the parents? And he doesn't only have a mom and a dad, he has his aunts, he has his, um, 
her family is also included as well. And I just really loved it. All right, thank you very much. Oh, wait. <laughs> Valerie's got more to say about the book. Okay. Um, this book starts with the premise that man has always lived with dragons on the world. So it's not like something happened and they appeared. There were dragons at the tr at, uh, in the Middle Ages. There were dragons back in the cave days, okay? Uh, but I thought, oh, this. Let me see. Um, that looks like a kid with Johnston. a sword. Um, I love the detail that they put in this book. I love Driver's Ed because in Driver's Ed, because you're driving something that is producing carbon fumes, you are kind of a target. And especially out in the country, you may be the only thing on the road producing carbon fumes. And in Driver's Ed, they learn the different types of dragons in the area what to do if one starts to target your car and come after it. And my favorite thing though is that there's this one dragon that the only thing you can do is to get near somebody else, another vehicle that's producing more carbon and hope he takes the other vehicle. <laughs> so yeah, this is kind of, but it's a very, uh, it's normal school, school buses and everything else. And then there's dragons always in it. But I love the way she infused dragons into every part of, of, of the life of both families and the characters. Thank you. All right. I think I might read this now. All right, okay. All right. We are also going to take the time to introduce No One Else Can Have You by Kath Kathleen Kale and Caroline and Lara, if you two. Kale, not Kale. Oh. Kale. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. No One Else Can Have You by Kathleen Hale was published by Harper Teen. As a 16 year old kippy of friendship, Wisconsin reads her best friend Ruth's diary. Her recently deceased best friend Ruth, I should note. She is shocked at what she learned and spurred to solve Ruth's murder, certain that the boy that was arrested is innocent. Can I say a few words? Sure. So, Kippy is obviously, she starts the book devastated because her best friend Ruth, Ruth who was popular at school and who she always hung out with and they were friends, she's been murdered. And so, obviously, the small town population, probably less than the junior class of my high school, really small town, begins to investigate and they, they come out immediately with this boy who obviously must have done it. He must have committed this horrific murder. There's nobody else who could have done it. And it's Ruth's boyfriend. And, well, ex-boyfriend, since she's dead now. And, but Kippy is convinced that he didn't do it. And the entire town says, no, Kippy, you're wrong. You're wrong. Kippy, no, that's, that, that's dumb. Kippy, why? Stop. And Kippy's been given Ruth's diary by her mom with a Sharpie and the instructions to cross out all the sex bits so that her mom can read it. Yes. That's spoiling her image of her daughter. <coughs> um, but as she reads this book, there's just so much. And I have to say that this is the funniest murder mystery I've ever read. I laughed out loud frequently. The people around me said, what are you doing? And I said, this, this murder mystery is so funny. I, I read it in Spanish class. Spanish teacher yelled at me. I couldn't put it down. It was a really enjoyable read. Um, some may argue that it was a bit insensitive at times, but honestly, the character, the narrator's voice was just very, very unique, very real. And I'm going to hand it off to Lion now. Yes, thank All you. Right. All right, so I just have to say that Kippy is real. I would love to have Kippy as a best friend because her dedication to start to find Ruth's murderer was just so powerful, even though she said, well, said all of those bad things about her in her diary. But other than that, so I love the little, addition, little additions to the novel, like with the um, anger management organization that was created um, to how Kip, to help, um, to even the plot twist that occurred in like the climax of the book because I did not see that coming at all. It was amazing. Um, overall, Kippy, I think, has one of the strongest character development that I've ever read in a book. 
and it was definitely hilarious, like what Caroline said, a really joy, funny read. So there's that. All right. Well, let's give a hand to the book. Thanks, Caroline. Oh, it is you again? Mm -hmm. These are the oh, nominees yes. for the book that your English teacher would most likely to teach. English, English teachers, language. pay attention. Teach. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <clears throat> Prisoner of Night and Fog by Anne Blackman. Blackman. Like Water on Stone by Dana, Dana Woolruff. Death Coming Up the Hill by Chris Crow. Vigilante Poets of Selwyn Academy by Kate At Adame. And The Strange and Beautiful Sorrows of Ava Lavender by Leslie Walton. From the And the winner is The Strange and Beautiful Sorrows of Ava Lavender by Leslie Walton. Oh my goodness, Brian, I would be honored oh, if you could yes. join me for. That's but a first, lot of a little words. forward. The Ezra Brain Social Justice Award was presented in honor of a former member, Ezra Brain, who consistently and tirelessly argued in support of young adult novels that promoted awareness of social justice issues. And the nominees are... The nominees are Grasshopper Jungle by Andrew Smith, <clears throat> The Summer I Saved the World in 65 Days by Michelle Weber Hurwitz. And, mm -hmm, thank you. The Silver People by Margarita Engel, and An Hidden Girl by Shaima and Lisa Wisowski. Drum roll, please. Winner is. That was three. Three. Those three stickers. Evil. Why is that three? There we go. Grasshopper Jungle by Andrew Smith. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Our yeah, next may award. I, may I call up Beth and Sneha, please, to present this? Um, so our nominees for Most Promising New Young Adult Author are Leslie Walton for The Strange and Beautiful Stars of Ava Lavender, Courtney C. Stevens for Baking Normal, Kathleen Hale for No One Else Can Have You, and Brian Conaghan, Conahan for When Mr. Dog Bites. And drum roll please. Leslie Walton for The Strange and Beautiful Sorrows of Ava Lavender. Thank you. Wait, what's that? Mm -hmm. The big one. Yeah. All right. Everyone likes Ava Lavender. All right. Finally. Next, the next award is the Lifetime Achievement Award presented David. by David. I love you. Wait, would you like to help, Shuba? Would you like to help us? Okay. Lifetime Achievement Award. David Allman's books include 2001 winner Kit Wilderness, first book Skilling, won a Prince Honor winner. Latest book, The True St Story of Monster, Bill Monster Billy Dean, as told by himself. Our next nominee is David Class, and he wrote You Don't Know Me, Dark Angel, and Firestorm. The latest book he wrote is Master Class. And Chris Lynch, books include Prince Honor Book, Free, Free Will, and Iceman, Gypsy Davy, and Shadowboxer, latest book, Little Blue Lies. And the next nominee is Laurie Hill Sanderson for The Impossible <coughs> Life of Memory. Okay. And yeah. drum roll. We didn't consider Laurie. Oh yeah, we didn't consider Laurie because she won our 2010 Lifetime Achievement Award. Only one Lifetime Achievement Award per lifetime. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> drum roll, please. No. And there's four of And the winner is David Almond for the true tale of the monster Billy Dean as told by himself. Right. 
David Allman, congratulations. I just wanted to let you know that the very first year this book club met and chose their winner, it was your book, Kit's Wilderness. And it also actually won the Prince Award nationally. So your book was the first one that we ever matched the national winner with. So thank you and congratulations. And here I have a quote from David Allen himself. <clears throat> Writing can sometimes be difficult, but sometimes it really does feel like a thing, a kind of magic. I think that stories are living things, among the most important things in the world. David Allen. All right. Now, we will introduce David and Ellen again from earlier at our red carpet introduction. For the Fashionista Awards. Happy? And there's the... So, our first award is for Best Fuzzy Extremities, and that goes to Chaya Williams. Woo! <laughs> The next award for best costume based on a character from a 2015 Y book is Emma Lynch. Oh, thank you. Oh, we got me play. Thanks, man. Thank you. Hand it to her. Oh, yeah, sorry. That's a thing. Why do you think she came up here? <laughs> well, our next award is for best cosplay ensemble, which is to myself. Caitlin Balding and David. Excellent. Bravo, Lucy. Bravo. Let's give it to Caitlin. Yeah. Yeah. Because she's sitting back down. Good. <laughs> uh, best sparkly shoes. <laughs> she behind us. Best streaming show saver with a single phone call, which is always in style, which goes to Miss Nicole. Ooh. Come on up here! Ooh. I love that phone call, by the way. Oh, that, that would actually be you streaming live. <laughs> oh. I knew that voice sounded familiar. Too familiar. Thank you very much. Too familiar. Wow. Okay. <laughs> well, now. Now it's time to reintroduce Valerie and Lisa. And Lisa. Come on up here. Please. Uh, my name is Lisa Ward, and I'm the luckiest woman in the world. My name is Valerie Nicholson, and I'm the luckiest woman in the world. Uh, but wait a minute, I'm the luckiest woman in the world. Oh, contraire, honey bear. I'm the luckiest woman <laughs> in the world. Well, I happen to be the advisor, one of the advisors, to the Eva Perry Library Mock Newberry Book Club, and that's why. Really? I happen to be one of the advisors to the Eva Perry Mock Prince Book Club for Teens. And that's what makes us the luckiest women Brr. in the world. <laughs> We have a lot of people we need to thank quickly. <laughs> we would like to thank um, Wake County Public Libraries for sponsoring us with this meeting place and all the books we can read. Um, especially, um, we'd like to thank Cheryl. You're doing a fab fabulous job ordering YA books for the library system. Thank her. We also want to uh, thank uh, Quail Ridge Bookstore on Wade Avenue in Raleigh, North Carolina. Carol, thank you for all the years of support to this book club and the Regulator Bookstore on 9th, F, I'm sorry, 9th Street in Durham, North Carolina. Keep those galleys coming. Thank you. And we would also like to thank all of the publishing companies who continue to send us galleys every year. Um, that let we, uh, we really assure you we read them and that's what helps us um, do this club. 
And if you are a publishing company of YA or juvenile books and you feel left out, please feel free to go box those galleys right now, send them to Eva Perry Regional Library, attention the Mock Book Club, 2100 Shepherd's Vineyard Drive, Apex, North Carolina, 27502. Uh, we'd also like to thank Bill, our intrepid cameraman and techie extraordinaire. Oh. Yeah. 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 And we also want to give a heartfelt <clears throat> thank to Dr. Chris Chrisman mm -hmm. for her vision to develop the Melinda Awards and to include this amazing oh. book club of teens. Oh. 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 Thank you guys so much. It's been a glorious 15 years. And uh, I just have to say that, I mean, it definitely has enriched our lives beyond any ability to express it. Oh my gosh. 15 years of reading books with teens. That's one fourth of my lifetime. <laughs> it has been a wonderful, wonderful experience. And I'm still here. So thank you guys very much to the teens that we have here today, the teens that started with us back in the year 2000. Thank you. The cake says, oh. Eva Perry, Mock Prince, 15 years, literary Hunger, Hunger Games. <laughs> the teens came up with the idea that we're the literary Hunger Games because only one book makes it you out. You can see the books <laughs> burning on the chair of shame. Oh, dear. <laughs> Put it up at the camera as we go out. Okay. <laughs> 15 years. We'll see you next year, right? It's been a Woo! great I'm holding a cake. Come on. Oh, I'll join you over here. Come over here. Hunger Games. Woo. May the best. Hunger Games. Yeah, may the best book win. Yeah. Hunger Games. And the odds Thanks forever in your Linda favor. Thanks to Linda for baking and decorating a beautiful cake. It looks delicious to me. Peter would be proud. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Don't eat it. <laughs> Are we all? Hold your places. We're still on. We're still on. <laughs> okay, just this will be archived later tonight, so you guys can enjoy it. Say, say goodbye. <laughs>